And my name is Corey Ross. I'm the district manager for the Wyndham Conservation District. And this presentation is sponsored by the Southeast Vermont CISMA. CISMA is an acronym that stands for Comprehensive Invasive Species Management Association. And we're a partnership of public and private um, agencies, organizations, and individuals and invasive plant experts that work to leverage collective resources to address our growing invasive species problem here in Southeast Vermont. And today's presenter is Elizabeth Spinney. She is the Invasive Plant Coordinator for the Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation Department. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth. Hi, thanks, Corey. Thanks for having me uh, speak with everyone this morning. And thank you all for joining in this morning. Um, so today's presentation is about navigating uh, free online resources about invasive plants. And bear with me as I remember how to use a PowerPoint. <laughs> Um, so I, I hope you are all safe and well. Um, like Corey said, my name is Elizabeth Spinney. I use she, her pronouns. And my job title is Invasive Plant Coordinator for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, which is part of the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, so if you've ever gone to a state park, uh, you've met a number of my colleagues. Uh, but my focus is on terrestrial invasive plants, how they're managed on state land, and helping others find the resources they need to take action. So I'm part of the forest health team, um, who are the folks who bring you the fall foliage report data. Um, they work on emerald ash borer uh, and respond even to fires on state land. Um, so I hope you'll be patient with us today. Um, we're experimenting with doing a live demonstration of these online resources. Uh, so I may pause to allow the web pages to load for all of us before proceeding to speak about what we're looking at. Um, since we aren't in person, uh, I'm just kind of a, a voice in the machine. Uh, I thought I'd share a little more of my background. So I grew up and went to school in Maine. Uh, I'm from down east. Uh, I moved to Vermont in 2012 and have been with Forest and Parks for about six years, um, where I lead a small seasonal crew doing invasive plant management in state parks and state forests. Um, you can see us in the bottom left photo. Uh, and we're the only ones hired in the state to focus on invasive plants on state land. Um, we are all 100% off, paid off of a grant. Um, and there isn't anyone really in charge of the problem of invasive plants in Vermont. Um, it is something that we're all dealing with. Um, and I think we can all learn from each other. Uh, and will best meet this challenge when we think in terms of supporting each other's work. So I've got a master's degree in biology uh, where I got to tromp around coastal Maine marshes. Um, you can see me way up a creek in Newcastle, Maine in that bottom right photo. Uh, and my passion is service. Uh, outside of my professional work as a public servant, uh, I'm on the volunteer boards for two nonprofits in Vermont. Uh, I'm also a woodworker and a maker. Uh, I'm a new mom. And um, this is a bit of an icebreaker. So my superpower is having birds land in my hand. So today we'll focus on navigating a few different online resources for invasive plants uh, and hopefully leave time at the end for questions. Um, and as Corey said, when, whenever we have a, a convenient stop, we'll, we'll check the chat too. So almost all of the information presented uh, is available on the website btinvasive.org. And this presentation, um, like Corey said, is being recorded. Uh, and I'll have the organizers share in some way a condensed version of the links for all attendees. Uh, so don't feel like you have to scribble down every, um, every URL or, or thing mentioned. Uh, we'll make sure you have access to that information later. Uh, so if you go along with me for a minute, I'd like to do a quick activity. Um, so make sure you can give yourself enough um, space between yourself and your screen. So just sort of sit back in your chair a little bit. So everyone from where you're sitting, look at this yellow circle. With both eyes open, put one hand in front of your face and without touching the screen, cover the circle with your thumb. You may still be able to see the circle somewhat but the outline of your thumb should be covering the circle. Now, without moving your hand, close your left eye. Where is your thumb? 
Think in your head, is it still covering the circle or has it moved? Now, without moving your hand, reopen your left eye and close your right eye. Think in your head, where is your thumb? Is it still covering the circle or has it moved? Okay, hands down. <laughs> so the eye that keeps your thumb covering the circle is your dominant eye. So every person has a dominant eye and it differs between people. Uh, how we see things both physically and mentally can be different than how others see things. We can all have different perspectives, even when we're talking about the same thing. We're all looking at the same circle on this screen, but seeing and experiencing different things. So today, we'll be talking somewhat about perspective. So the first perspective I'd like to discuss is understanding the reality of where we are with invasive plants in Vermont. So this is called an invasion curve commonly used in the study of invasion biology. Along the bottom is time, and along the vertical is infestation size and cost of control. The cheapest, easiest way to manage invasive plants is prevention or early detection, which you can see on the far left. On the right, we see that local control and management are our only options. In the center, we can see where public awareness typically begins. Many invasive species that are common, but fall into the third far right section of the, the local management and control only area. But some places in Vermont, those common species, they're, they're still in the far left section. So my hope is to instill in you a sense that we can still do something to protect the things that we value with the understanding that in many cases, we're talking about long-term stewardship and monitoring versus eradication. And this involves all of us stepping up and helping to spread the word and not the plants. And your involvement today by taking the time to join us to learn more is doing just that. So it's only been the last couple of decades where we've realized the full impact invasive plants have on natural communities here in Vermont. And the effective management of these invasive plants is also still evolving. The next big step in control after learning about the issue and practicing ID of the common species is setting priorities for our control work. We have limited time, limited resources, and taking the time to set priorities will help us be more effective in the work we are able to complete. So I really love this graphic because it goes against my gut instinct and original perspective of how to approach control. We want to prioritize reducing spread because we're talking in many cases about local control and containment, which again is a long-term stewardship approach. So we need to prioritize removing outliers and keeping the infestations to the core locations, which you can see um, in this graphic here with the, the larger circle indicating the outliers and that smaller center circle, sort of the core, um, and then that arrow indicating the direction that control efforts should move. And to our luck, catching the outliers before they get big enough to produce seed or spread vegetatively helps reduce the need for frequent return trips to these sites reducing the overall needed effort. Another perspective I want us to talk about is what does invasive mean to you? So as I share my perspective on this question, I'd like you to reflect on what it might mean for you. So for me, in my work, an invasive plant is not native to where you found it, meaning it does not have those natural checks and balances. Now, not all exotic species to North America and Vermont are invasive. To make a plant invasive versus just exotic, uh, it needs to cause some kind of harm to things we value, have some sort of impact. And talking about perspective again, species from the Northeast can be invasive elsewhere. So there's a coastal grass, um, a Spartina, from the Atlantic coast in the US that's invasive on the West coast. And goldenrod, um, there's a number of goldenrod um, and it's a native plant you can find in Vermont, uh, is invasive in Europe. And ultimately, 
these are all just plants. <laughs> They're growing and being plants and they got to where they are because they were transported by humans. They were not inherently evil or bad, uh, but are a lasting reminder of humankind's ability to make mistakes. We're all learning and, we, and making changes to protect the things we value today. So when I shared that definition of invasive plants that I use um, in my work, I, I mentioned that these species need to have some sort of impact. And those impacts, again, are to things that we as a collective group have placed value upon. And this perspective of what is valued has shifted over time. It wasn't long ago that we saw value in planting these plants for things like conservation and landscaping, but we didn't understand the, the full consequences of our actions. Our values and perspectives have changed. So it comes as no surprise that invasive plants have negative impacts to Vermont forests, the native plants, wildlife, and I'll just take a minute to share with you some additional examples. So invasive shrubs and trees that are quick growing and shade tolerant can cover a forest understory, shading out and out competing native plants, including the next generation of canopy trees. You can lose forest regeneration, lose future generations of sugar maple trees, future generations of trees important for lumber and firewood, you even lose species diversity that makes special habitats like this silver maple ostrich fern floodplain forest that's pictured. And invasive plants can also impact native plants like spring ephemeral wildflowers. When a number of different plants live together, they compete. They compete for sunlight, water, nutrients, and even for space. And our native Vermont plants have evolved within a community and have a long list of other species they normally struggle against. Invasive plants escape all or most of the normal natural controls they would have had in their own natural communities, which is one way they're able to outcompete native plants for those resources. And invasive plants can impact wildlife with cascading effects on all levels of the food web when they outcompete and displace native plants that our wildlife depend on. So for example, the West Virginia white butterfly, which you can see pictured in the top right, is listed as a species of special concern in Vermont. This butterfly emerges early in the spring and depends on rich woods host plants, such as toothwort, to complete its life cycle. The invasive plant garlic mustard exudes a similar chemical attractant to that of native toothwort, and that similarity can confuse the West Virginia white butterfly into laying its eggs on garlic mustard instead of toothwort. And the life cycle is unable to complete because the plant is toxic to the caterpillars. Okay, so let's switch gears and go check out the vtinvasive.org website together. But first, I'll, let's take a quick check in. Are there any questions in chat? Nothing um, has come up yet. Okay, awesome. I am going to switch us over to the website. And so while that's happening um, and loading, I'll just share that the original website was made possible by a collaboration. Um, let's see, are, are you all able to see the website? Looks good. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, the original website was made possible by a collaboration um, with my agency, UVM Extension, and the Nature Conservancy of Vermont. Uh, in 2015, UVM Extension received a grant that allowed a small group of us to overhaul the website um, and launch this new version in 2017. Um, the website is maintained by myself and three other colleagues across uh, these various institutions, uh, and it's not a major part of any of our job descriptions. So when we can collaborate or people very kindly write in with errors or updates, it is very much appreciated because this website is a labor of love. And so there are two main areas to navigate around the website, the home page and the gallery pages. And so um, Hopefully at the top middle of the screen, you can see my cursor. Uh, it should be a black arrow. Uh, and let's go 
to the home page here uh, is the page that you will get when you type in vtinvasives.org. And on the home page, there are quick links to gallery pages. Um, across the top here, you can see drop downs um, with information on impacts of invasive species, how you can get involved through management, outreach, reporting, volunteering. Uh, there's even a current news section. Um, there's a newsletter that you can sign up for, and also an About Us, which has contact information. So let's click on Volunteer. And let's scroll down to the bottom. And here you can see, uh, hopefully, <laughs> information about how you can get involved, uh, including with your local cooperative invasive species management areas. Um, and those are just some quick links to a number of the various groups that are working in Vermont. So I'm going to go back to the home page. And at the top of the home page, there's also a search feature in the top right where you can type in whatever you're looking for and be taken directly to a list of all resources on the website about that topic. So we've been looking at the top of the page. I'm going to scroll down and let's look at the bottom. And I'm going to pause here because I know this will take a couple of seconds to load. So the bottom half of the home page has a number of highlighted resources with quick links to hot topics. Um, you can jump directly to the gallery of terrestrial plants. Uh, there's a action button if you want just information about emerald ash borer. There's also report it, which is um, our report it tool, which is actually how we get a number of our emerald ash borer sightings. Uh, and I am going to uh, go into that a little later. So let's move to, so that's the home page, which is one of the two main ways we can navigate. So let's go to the other way, which is the gallery pages. So at the very top of the web of the home page on the website, there are two buttons on the right, invasives on land and invasives on water. So I'm going to click on invasives on land. And this should bring us to the gallery of land invasives. And from here you can navigate um, to information on impact, management, regulation, um, and you can see all of those listed on the right. And you can also, if you scroll down, you can sort the gallery page itself um, by areas of interest, like the type of invasive, the landscape, or you can search for specific species. So I'm gonna do a sort. I'm going to just look for terrestrial plants under type and then hit apply. So here I've sorted by type of invasive, looking just for terrestrial plants. <clears throat> to the right of the search bar is a key indicating that any tile below with a cross out symbol indicates that the plant is state regulated. And you can see the cross out symbol just below on the tile for common barberry. When you scroll down this page, you can see that each tile represents a different species. So let's click on, let's do common buckthorn and look at its species page. So each species page has the common name, the scientific name, photos to help with identification, photos of common lookalikes. Um, and below there are sections with information on biology, management, and distribution. And in the top right, there are these two buttons, treatment and fact sheet. And each of those buttons will take you directly to a viewable, printable, and downloadable resource, either about treatment options or a fact sheet. So I'm gonna click on fact sheet.
And so while that's loading, I'll just share that there are um, new fact sheets for 11 of the species. Uh, and that was made possible through a collaborative agreement with my department and the Agency of Transportation. Um, and we're excited to share them with you as the previous fact sheets were last updated in 2012 by the Nature Conservancy. And we hope to add 11 new treatment sheets this year and are working on securing more funding to continue to update uh, fact sheets for all species on the website. All right, so let's go back to the Buckthorn page. And let's click on the Return to Land Gallery button, which is in the way top right, um, and navigate to the Resource Hub, which houses all of the viewable, printable, and downloadable resources. I'm going to click on Return to Gallery. And then in that selection area that I pointed out before on the right side, I'm going to click on Resource Hub. And in the Resource Hub, you can sort by type of species, topic, or use the search um, with keywords, titles, or names. So I'm going to do a sort. I'm going to sort by terrestrial plants. And I'm going to say resources for landowners and communities and then hit apply. And that will show me all of the resources that are tagged for those areas of interest. So here are sort of the results by type. So terrestrial plants and by topic, resources for landowners and communities. And each of these results takes you again to a viewable, printable, or downloadable resource. So let's scroll down and Let's look at the Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area resource. So you can see I moved my cursor over the title of that resource and the color changed, uh, which means that it's clickable. I can read a description about it and then I can click on the title and then click on the resource and I can view it. Uh, print it or download it or share it even. You can um, click and copy the URL and send that directly to somebody. All right, so let's go back. I'm going to scroll up to the top and let's get back to the home page. So we've, we've gone down the rabbit hole a little bit. Um, we've clicked and we've clicked again and we've clicked again. Um, and if you're ever lost, navigating back to the home page is as simple as clicking on the VT Invasives logo, which should be present at the top left of every page on the website. So I'm going to move my cursor over this logo that has an insect and uh, two leaves. And it says Vermont Invasives. And if I click on that, it brings me back to the home page. So another important page of the website I'll walk through is one you may already be familiar with if you're dealing with Emerald Ash Borer in Vermont. And it is the Report It tool. And I mentioned it briefly a few minutes ago. I'm on the home page. I'm going to scroll to the bottom. Now the report it button is available across many pages of the website. Um, but if you're in a pinch trying to remember, uh, the easiest place to find it is at the bottom of the home page. So I'm going to click on report it. Give it a second to load. And you can submit reports of aquatic invasive plants or animals terrestrial or upland invasive plants, invasive insects, and even tree diseases like uh, oak wilt. So to report an invasive terrestrial plant, uh, click on the button labeled upland plant.
And then you'll be taken to the landing page for reporting upland plants. Um, review the information on the report it page to make sure you report it to the correct place. Um, you do that through BT invasives for early detection of invasive plants or through iNaturalist for common invasive plants. Uh, there are resources available from this page to help you identify which type you might have. Um, and this is incredibly valuable for the work that is done in Vermont to manage for these species. Uh, and the time you take to confirm ID before reporting helps the state scientists most efficiently use their time to track down new infestations. And I just want to do a quick time check. OK, good. So maybe let's look at what it looks like. So I just clicked on Submit Report. And you can see this is the report page. So information you'll want to provide is when you saw the plant, the species you think you saw, um, some contact information so we can uh, follow up with you um, either to confirm uh, identification or confirm location. And then photos. Photos are incredibly valuable in helping us do ID um, because, um, you know, <laughs> I, I think we, uh, you know, Vermont is a small state, um, but it is not the easiest state to get around. Um, and there's only uh, so many places myself and my colleagues uh, can be at any given time. And so being able to see a photograph um, of the plant uh, and ID it through a photo is incredibly valuable. And taking photos of things like the flower or how the leaves are arranged um, or the buds on the stems, those are all very, very helpful and valuable things that you can include in a submission. All right, I'm gonna click back and let that load. And then I'm gonna click on the logo and go back to the home page. And I'm going to click on the top menu bar about us and contact. And then let that load. And so if you have any questions that aren't answered by the website, you can contact any of the website's partner or organization outreach coordinators. Uh, and while they may not have all the answers, um, they'll do their best to connect you with the information or people you might need. And I just did a time check, so I know we've got time still. There are a few other websites I'd like to share with you. The first is, of course, the Southeast Vermont SISMA uh, Invasive Species Resource page where you can see a number of resources that they've pulled together. And you can also, um, quickly access a list of upcoming webinars and recorded webinars. And another Vermont specific resource is the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation's Waste Management Program. So they are the ones who oversee the disposal guidelines. And their yard and debris page has information on what to do about disposal of invasive species. Another Vermont specific online resource is iNaturalist. And it's a project, um, specifically a project called Mapping for Healthy Forests Vermont. Um, and it's where you can upload observations of invasive plants. I think I mentioned that when we were looking at the reported page. Um, and um, I'll just also put a plug in for the Vermont Atlas of Life. Um, when you make an observation through iNaturalist, you can tag a number of projects. Um, and if you find an invasive plant, tag Mapping for Healthy Forest Vermont and tag Vermont uh, Atlas of Life. And so let's look at some regionally useful resources or websites. 
So the first one that I'll show is Gobotany, um, which is through the Native Plant Trust, which used to be New England Wildflower Society. Uh, and so while this resource isn't specifically about invasive species, it is for all plants found in New England, including invasive species. So you can look up specific species. Uh, you can use a key to try to identify a species. Uh, you can use their Ask a Botanist feature, or you can find useful teaching resources. And it also shows you a general idea of where these species are present across New England. And the next resource I'll show is also a regional one. So this is through Cornell University. It's the New York Invasive Species Research Institute. They provide a breakdown and summary of all current research in the realm of invasive species and their management. And it is run out of Cornell University. And they have a number of science-based resources for land managers. This is Mistaken Identity. It's an NRCS resource for the Mid-Atlantic, but there's a lot of species overlap with Vermont. Um, the guide has great images and descriptions of key identifying features. Let me pull up, like here's an example, is Norway maple. And it also shows you native plant lookalikes and how to tell the difference. And so the lookalike for Norway maple might be a sugar maple. Oh, their website's not working. I'll send the link. <laughs> There's another group called RISC, uh, which are based out of UMass Amherst. Um, and they also, like the Cornell site, have a bunch of information on um, current research uh, around invasive species and their management. And then um, if we look nationally, there's a website called EDMAP which lets you see the distribution of invasive species across North America. Um, so here, what I did to get to this is I clicked across the top, there's um, distribution maps, and then I searched by plants and shrubs and looked at the page for multiflora rose. And you can see all of the um, locations across North America where multiflora rose has been reported in EDMAP. And if you zoom in or zoom out, um, you can get a, a, a more uh, localized or generalized idea of the locations of those reports. And there's also the North American Invasive Species Management Association, which produces a monthly news and research summary uh, which you can access on their website here or through a listserv. And they also have numerous recorded presentations and resources. And finally, we can also look internationally. So the Center for Agriculture and Bioscience International, or CABI, is an international intergovernmental um, not-for-profit um, and they're looking to improve lives by applying um, scientific expertise to solve problems in agriculture and the environment. And they have this invasive species compendium, uh, which shows you profiles for invasive species and their global impacts. And here I've pulled up the page for a honeysuckle, Lonisera maroi. Um, and if we scroll down, you can see all the information on this species, but from a global perspective. And you see how small the scroll bar is. It goes, <laughs> it keeps going. <laughs> oh, 
All right, so it should have switched back to PowerPoint presentation. Yep, okay, great. Um, so maybe let's check in and see if there are any questions in chat. Sure. Um, so one person um, had a question about the VT Invasives website. And uh, this person writes, I find it easier to cut and stump treat some species during the winter. However, I don't see uh, photos of winter bark and buds. Is there any plan to add winter photos of various invasives? Oh, that's a great question. That is definitely on my bucket list. Um, and if anybody has photos of these species that they can share um, and are willing to have them um, up on the website, um, we would certainly give full, cre as, uh, uh, full credit um, for those photographs. We definitely appreciate it. Um, you know, like I said, this is a, a, a labor of love and we, we always appreciate any chance to collaborate. Uh, but I completely agree. It would be very useful to have those. Thanks. Um, the next question is about control, uh, just a general um, invasive control question. Do you want, okay. do you prefer that at the end or would you like that now? Um, if you can, maybe let's save that for the end. Sounds good. Uh, and Corey answered the other one. Um, someone had a question about where to find one of the web pages. And as you said, uh, everyone in this uh, webinar will receive a list of those web pages. Is that right, Elizabeth? Correct, yep. Great. Awesome. So uh, I will uh, wrap up with a few items. So now with, um, with this topic and this restoration work, it can feel overwhelming at times. Um, and that's expected and it's totally understandable. And I do want to share though, that you can make a difference. My colleagues and I like to say that there are simple, easy steps we can all take. We can learn and we can get involved. And that all adds up to us making a difference in Vermont. And your time spent today is a great first step. Taking action by going out on your own land or land in your community and imply, applying what you learn or talking with your neighbors and friends or local organizations like the Southeast SISMA or conservation commissions helps raise awareness and exponentially amplifies the work myself and my colleagues do when we speak and work with groups around the state. Oh, my screen sharing stopped. My apologies. Let's do that again. And screen share. It also closed my PowerPoint. How fun is that? <laughs> so let's skip ahead to where we were. All right. So some takeaways. Invasive plants harm things we value. Um, our perspective of what those values are has changed over time. Uh, there are a number of great free online resources to learn about invasive plant identification, how to control them, and how to prioritize our efforts. And you can make a difference. And FPR's Forest Health Team is a resource to you and your organizations or communities on top of all of the other resources we talked about today. And let me see, let me turn my video back on. And so I wanna thank you again for your time, but before we take questions, um, if you'll indulge me, I would like to end with a story um, about changing perspective and um, it's the perspective um, taken by those of us that do this work every day. Um, so for many years, I felt a little bit like Sisyphus, 
uh, toiling away only to have to push that stone back up the hill again. Um, but a couple years ago, I remembered a section of prose, The Star Thrower by Lauren Isley, who is an American naturalist and writer, uh, where he reflected on a seemingly monumental task. Uh, and if you'll indulge me, uh, again, <laughs> I'd like to read briefly from that. So uh, I will set the scene. Uh, Lauren is at a conference in Costabelle uh, along the beach where the tide has gone and thousands of sea stars are laid out on the sand. Isley comes across someone methodically picking up and throwing stars back into the receding waves. I had been unbelieving. I had walked away from the star thrower in the hardened indifference of maturity. On a point of land, as though projecting into a domain beyond us, I found the star thrower. Silently, I sought and picked up a still living star, spinning it far out into the waves. I spoke once briefly. I understand, I said. Call me another thrower. Only then I allowed myself to think. He is not alone any longer. After us, there will be others. We are part of the rainbow, an unexplained projection into the natural. As I went down the beach, I could feel the drawing of a circle in men's minds. It was a visible model of something toward which man's mind had striven, the circle of perfection. I picked and flung another star. I could feel the movement in my body. It was like a sewing, the sewing of life on an infinitely gigantic scale. I looked back across my shoulder, small and dark against the receding rainbow the star thrower stooped and flung once more. I never looked again. The task we had assumed was too immense for gazing. I flung and flung again while all about us roared the insatiable waters of death. For it was men as well as starfish that we sought to save. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And hopefully we have some questions because we still have some time. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I, um, before I start in on a couple of the questions, you got um, some thank yous from the audience uh, for the great presentation and for the uh, great resources that you shared today. So start with I'm that. Stop screen share there so I can finally see everyone. <laughs> <laughs> sure so uh one of the questions is a, um i will read it i have invasive plants on a hillside that is along a stream can the plants be removed what would i replant what are the rules of removing plants near water oh that's a great question and very thoughtful um so there um I'm getting ahead of myself. So there are uh, regulations, of course, around vegetation along um, lakeshore and invasive species are an exemption from that. And um, certainly our riparian areas are very important as well to protect. Um, and I, I would say that um, in my experience in, in management that I've done, that um, that is okay, as long as we are thoughtful about our approaches. Um, and I'm trying to remember the other part of the question. Sure. What are the rules? Uh, what would I replant? And what are the rules for removing plants near water? Great. Um, so without site specific information, I, I don't know that I have um, a great sort of like off the cuff answer, but there are a number of, of resources out there about planting with natives. 
Um, there are some on the VT Invasives website, but I would offer that your conservation districts and maybe even the FISMA are, are great um, places to, to check in about uh, native riparian species that would be great for your particular area. Let's see. Um, there's another question. I'm sure I'm not missing any. Um, what is the best way to remove mature bittersweet? That is a very, um, <laughs> boy, I could give a presentation just on that. Um, and again, I think it goes back to, to looking at that, the, the graphics that I included at the beginning of the presentation. You know, um, if we are, managing mature bittersweet, it's probably an established population. And so you're probably talking about um, containment versus eradication. And um, so certainly stopping the mature uh, individual vines from producing fruit um, is a great way to slow down the spread. Um, but then also going out into whatever habitat that mature vine is in and looking for the small sprouts and removing them very carefully. They have very sinuous roots. Um, uh, has, has anyone ever heard of a Cape Codder? Uh, it's this really um, um, interesting garden tool that's really helpful for getting um, roots up um, that are kind of shallow. And so those young individuals tend to have pretty shallow roots. Um, and so you can go along with the, the Cape Cotter and get those, those, those little roots of the, the immature bittersweets up. Um, but those, those would probably be a couple of starting points, I would suggest. Not a good answer. Oh, please feel free to um, send me an email and I'd love to give you more information. Um, it's just um, what I could provide in the, the time that we have and get to the other questions. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, somebody is reflecting back on your reading about how, um, when asked what difference can you possibly make by throwing one starfish into the sea when there are so many to, to save thousands, millions, the starfish thrower thought for a minute and then answered, well, it makes a difference to the ones I throw. And so uh, your reading was enjoyed. Oh, um, there is some uh, new question. What are your feelings on herbicides? Thank you, that's a great question. And it's certainly something that we should all talk about um, because it, it always kind of feels like the elephant in the room, doesn't it? Um, and I, I think that um, it's certainly something that we need to be reflective on, um, our, our use of, of one of the tools, um, of many tools that we have um, when we're doing integrated pest management. And should it be the only tool that we ever use? I don't think so. But there are specific instances um, where it is a effective lower impact tool. So even doing mechanical management can have really uh, lasting impacts on the physical environment. Um, so I, I think Jennifer has some experience with this too, when we're talking about um, protecting things like we're a threatened or endangered species, um, often we have to be very surgical in our approach because they're um, the, the, the way that they are in their environment is, is so apt for being um, disrupted. And so when we can use um, chemicals like herbicides in that sort of surgical approach, I think it's um, very effective and something that we should consider. Um, and so that brings up a question that we did get mailed in, um, and I'll just share that. So someone did submit a question uh, before the presentation. Uh, I want to use uh, chemicals in my backyard to manage invasive plants, but the one that's most effective for that species 
is only purchasable by certified applicators. What should I do? Um, and so in Vermont, the Agency of Agriculture oversees pesticide certification, um, and they take it very seriously. Uh, in fact, to even talk to you about pesticides, I personally have to have taken and passed the certification core test and a special category. And I have to maintain that certification with continuing credits each year. And so while some chemicals are accessible to people who aren't certified, you know, just like um, your backyard weed killers are, I would advise that if you want to treat invasive plants with chemicals, Going through the certification yourself as a landowner is a good thing. Um, you know, it isn't required um, and you don't really have to do it unless you want to use restricted chemicals. Um, but I have recommended this to a number of other landowners and those that did do the course said that they appreciated the depth of knowledge that they received um, and that they take the application of herbicides much less for granted. Um, and if that isn't a time commitment that you can put in, um, there are a number of uh, certified contractors who do, um, who, who can do this work in Vermont. Um, and the, the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, through USDA, they, they maintain an uh, active list of those contractors. Um, and so if there is an interest, I could share that, that resource with everyone too. So there's uh, a few more coming in. Um, and so um, the person that asked about herbicides also followed up with, especially for plants close to, to trees with roots intertwined. And um, I think you covered that in your answer, like integrated um, approach. Um, someone offered that uh, using a stump treatment can minimize uh, the amount of herbicide used and help with um, close quarters. Do you, did you have anything that you wanted to add to no, the I, question? I, I think that's great. I, an active chat, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and see, that's what I mean. I, I, we can all learn from each other. It's great. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what method of control would you use to get rid of an acre or more of wild turtle in a field? Ouch. Oh, I am sorry if that is not just a, a scenario, <laughs> if that is an, a, an actual thing that you are dealing with. Um, an acre of turbo. And that is, that's a hard one to come up with a game plan sort of off the cuff. Um, there is, um, a great strategizing tool. Um, I, I think I linked it in the list of resources that you all get, um, but it is a, a resource put together by the Nature Conservancy, which uh, it's a matrix of um, what kind of strategy to use for your management. Um, and it breaks it down into um, site-specific, species-specific, and then it, um, breaks it down into actionable steps of, of things to consider. Um, and so that's a great place to start. Um, also looking up, um, like understanding the, the biology of the, the plant in your particular area. So um, when, does it, um, when does it leaf out? When does it flower? Um, will help you uh, bet, best time any treatment you, you do utilize. Um, and certainly, certainly feel free to, to reach out to me and, and maybe we can game plan a little bit together. Uh, 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 someone um, provided in our chat the link for the buckthorn blaster, which is a cut stump treatment. Um, I didn't know if you had any comments about that or just that is definitely a tool. Um, it, it, that that I'm looking at it. That particular model isn't one that um, we've utilized, um, but I have heard that it is a, a effective tool that people have used. Um, 
someone wants to know how to take the herbicide applicator course. Um, I see the exam information at um, Agency of Ag, Food and Markets. Um, yeah. Do you want to share something about a class? Um, if, if you could throw that, that page into the chat, um, I think on that page is also the contact for Anne um, McMillan, and she, she would be um, the person to contact um, to find out about um, when the next exams are happening, and that page should also have information about um, the materials you can use to prepare for the exam as well. We'll do that. Don't, oh, we got one new one here. I'm just reading it first. All right, um, I'm a private forest family um, owner certified nationally and ATFS. What is your current presentation outreach um, prior to and once we're done with COVID-19? Um, this person is suggesting it would be good to present to forest owners and professionals uh, from around the world at the annual, at, uh, I think it's New York State Woodman's Field Days in Boonville, Central New York. Last attendance, nearly 55,000, 75th anniversary in 2022. And uh, this person is the forestry education co-chair. So. Um, wow, what an audience. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I am part of the uh, Vermont Department of Forest and Parks on the, the forest health team. And so my, my focus is on um, working, and because I'm grant funded, my focus is working specifically with Vermonters, but I expect that I have equivalent colleagues in New York that would be um, a fantastic fit for um, the, that's really exciting, the 75th uh, anniversary event. Um, and uh, my outreach uh, typically was doing presentations like this in person, and we sort of shifted gears now in doing uh, webinars. Um, oh, yeah, great. Jen just posted the link to the um, information through the Agency of Agriculture. Um, and yes, you do have to sort of study and then take the exam. So study on your own and take the exam. Um, prior to the pandemic, they would do like a crash course one day um, uh, primer kind of thing in person um, where you could ask questions um, and then take the exam at the end, but I don't think they are currently doing anything like that. I think that covers things. And I, I really appreciate you all taking the time to join us this morning. Um, and uh, I, it, again, if you have any questions or you wanna follow up on anything um, that we talked about today, um, please feel free to, to reach out by email. Um, my contact information uh, should be in the presentation, but also on the vtinvasives.org website. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And there will be an email to everyone who registered for this that will go out in the next couple of days that'll have a link to the recording as well as um, Elizabeth's PDFs of her presentation and any resources she wanted to share. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye.